Welcome everyone to the webinar. This is Memory Improvement Techniques for Students. I want to thank you all for coming out today. I think you'll find this very, very helpful. This has been one of our most popular webinars, actually. We had a few thousand people register for this session, so there's definitely intense interest in how to improve your memory. And we're going to talk about how to improve your memory as it relates to reading. Maybe you have to memorize something. Maybe What if you have to memorize an equation? New vocabulary, whether it's learning a new language or maybe new vocabulary in a you know, technical information that you're studying. Um, I want to remind everyone before we get started here, uh, we actually do these, despite this being a an online session, we also do live courses. So if you're interested in inviting us to do a workshop on your college campus or at your organization, we do workshops for students and employees all across the U.S. Um, so I've got my contact info over there. If you want to email me at paul at irisreading.com, you can do that and we'd be more than happy to do a live session. But today's session, I want you to think about all those times that you've been told to memorize something throughout school and maybe even at work. Memorize this, memorize that. Think about this. How many times have you actually been taught, here's how you memorize something? And unfortunately, most people aren't really taught memory techniques. Now, when I say memory techniques, I'm talking about more than just mnemonic devices. For some of you that may be familiar with mnemonic devices, mnemonic devices are like quick little tricks for remembering things. Um, you may have done mnemonic devices for remembering maybe, uh, you know, uh, learning music, or sometimes people remember the order of operations, or you might remember the planets through a mnemonic device. Sometimes mnemonic devices could be like acronyms or little rhymes, things like that. Uh, we're not going to discuss mnemonic devices here, but actually... This is going to be more important than mnemonic devices because mnemonic devices only work on a very specific piece of information. The memory techniques we talk about today, you'll be able to apply them in a variety of ways. So you can almost think of it as like memory principles that we'll talk about, like an infrastructure that will help you to remember things like, for example, how to remember what you read, how to remember equations, and how to remember vocabulary. And these three areas are things that are very uh, important to students, regardless of whether you're in high school or college or you know undergrad or graduate level. Um, and what we're going to discuss today are visual memory techniques. So this is very important because human beings are very good at remembering visual information. I want you to know that today's webinar is actually content from a course that we have on our website. Uh, it's called the Speed Reading Mastery Course. And this is actually a course that talks about not just improving your speed, but also how to improve comprehension and memory. If you're interested in that, you can check it out at the link on your screen. Um, but this is there's 10 webinars in that particular course. Uh, this particular webinar goes over, if I could just show you right here. If you go to irisreading.com slash mastery, this is what the link looks like. And this is a 10... 10, we 10 webinars in this course, as you can see here. Today's session, we're actually going to take a sample from it, learning to read and remember visually. That's where this content is coming from, although it's not going to be exactly the same word for word. We're actually targeting today's session towards students. So how do you remember things? For example, uh, you know, like we said, equations, vocabulary remembering what you read. But if you're interested in a more comprehensive course that goes beyond just like today's hour session, you can go to irisreading.com slash mastery. Now, I want you to think about your memory. How do you feel about it right now? For me, I feel sometimes our memory is awesome. Sometimes it's amazing. For example, you ever hear a song comes on the radio, let's say, and you haven't heard that song in years, but you know the lyrics of the song. That's when your memory is awesome. But sometimes your memory sucks. <laughs> For example, you ever get introduced to someone, they tell you their name, and then you immediately forget their name. You're wondering, wait, they just told me, how come I can't remember their name? And this is where, uh, you know, sometimes our memory is uh, faltering. So this reminds me of something that psychologists call the Baker-Baker paradox. And the Baker-Baker paradox is very interesting. And here's why. Uh, they take a group of participants in the study, and they are all introduced initially to someone named Mr. Baker. Now, they, the people conducting the study, they want to see how many people will remember this person's name, this Mr. Baker. Now, they don't tell the people in the study that they're actually testing them on that. Otherwise, they'd put more emphasis and try to remember it. They tell them that the study is about something else, but they're introduced to someone named Mr. Baker. Now, they take these people a few days later, they bring them back, and they ask them, how many of you remember this guy's name? Do you remember his name? And most people would forget that his name is Mr. Baker. 
It's like 90%. Now, that's not surprising. Most people know that. A lot of people have trouble remembering names. But the funny thing is they take a separate group of participants in the study, and they're introduced to the same exact person. What? It's a little different. They're introduced to someone, the same person, but they're told that that person is a baker. I am a baker. Now, the funny thing is, all of these people are brought back a few days later, and they're asked the same thing. What, what do you remember about this person? Not the person's name, because they weren't told the name. Instead, they were told the occupation. And the funny thing is, most people remember the occupation. About It's almost the absolute flip of the other scenario. Most people remember that that person was a baker. That was their occupation. Now, the funny thing is, that's why they call this the baker-baker paradox. It's because in one situation, it's hard to remember. My name is Mr. Baker. In another situation, I am a baker, it's very easy to remember, but there's a reason for it. The reason is human beings remember visual information very, very easily. In the situation of a baker, how do you picture a baker? What visual associations do you have to a baker? Um, for me, I'm thinking, you know, bread, cake. I'm thinking, you know, a baker would have like one, maybe one of those baker hats, kind of like the Pillsbury Doughboy. <laughs> you might think of flour on his or her hands. So we have visual references for a baker, but you don't have a visual reference for Mr. Baker unless you create one. And that's why names are hard to remember and occupations are easier to remember. And again, visual information, very easy to remember. Another thing that's very important you to know, for you to know about your memory is that you remember things that are strange. Things that are weird, out of the ordinary, absurd, are so easy to remember. And I'll give you a good example of this. When you watch commercials on TV, or if you ever see Super Bowl commercials, why is it that they go, advertisers go out of their way to create some ridiculous commercial? They try to make it as funny as possible, just weird and strange. It's because advertisers know that if they make something absurd or out of the ordinary, the consumer is more likely to remember that commercial. So keep that in mind because these two principles here, that you remember visual information and that you remember things that are strange, are going to underlie the two uh, the techniques that we talk about in this webinar. So the first technique we're going to discuss is the numeric peg system. Now, this is not widely taught. You very rarely have this taught in high schools or colleges, but it should be taught. When I learned this... Um, I wish it had been taught to me back in high school because it would help me memorize so many things. And we're going to start actually by implementing the system. I'm going to teach you how to implement it. And we're going to start with just a simple grocery list. So think about how many items it would take before you actually made a list. For most people, after like four or five, maybe six items, they'd say, you know what, I better write this down. But I'm going to have you memorize a 10 item list right now. And we're going to use the numeric peg system as an example you're going to learn how to use it for this 10 item list. Now, I'm going to show you the list right now. I don't want you to write it down. I just want you to see it on the screen. As you can see, bread is number one, milk is number two, and so on and so forth. You're going to memorize this list. And actually, you're going to use that numeric peg system. It's a visual memory technique. After we memorize the list, I'm going to teach you how you can apply this to remembering what you just read. Because we got to start off easy. And believe it or not, you're going to memorize this list in order. I know some of you are probably thinking, no, that's not going to happen. Um, I, I want to prove to you that your memory is a little better or a lot better than you really think it is. And usually it's just a matter of having a strategy. This is a strategy for remembering the list. Here's how we're going to do it. Why do they call it the numeric peg system? It's because each number is getting pegged to a visual object that you could see in your mind. So I want you to memorize right now that one is going to represent a pencil. So you need to commit that to memory at this moment. One equals pencil. Now, why is one representing a pencil? Only because it has the same shape. One and a pencil have the same shape. Next one, number two. Number two is going to represent visually a swan. So I want you to memorize right now. Two is a swan. So here's the curvy part of the two and the flat part at the bottom. Picture, when I, when I tell you the number two, you're going to imagine a swan. This is going to be helpful later on, and you'll see in a moment. So right now we just need to visualize numbers one through 10. Number three is going to represent McDonald's. So I want you to, when I tell you three, you're going to think McDonald's. Of course, you got to turn your head a little sideways, but three is going to remind us of the golden arches of McDonald's. Number four is a chair. As you can see, I've got this chair upside down, but I want you, when you think of four, I want you to think in your head, 
Sure. And again, later on, you'll see where this is going because we need to start off with the infrastructure, which is get all of your numbers and make them visuals. Five is a hook. So this one might be a little hard given the image I chose, but here's the top part of the hook. There's the top part of the five. There's the curvy part of the five. I need you to memorize right now that five equals a hook. So before we move forward, let's do a quick recap. So you remember, number one, what was number one? Think of it in your head. Number one was pencil. What did what was the visual for number two? Do you remember? Two is a swan. Next one, three. Do you remember three? Three is McDonald's. And four, you should remember, is chair. And five, do you remember what number five is? Five is a hook. Now, I'm doing this recap because keep in mind, with your memory, repetition is extremely important. I will repeat that. Repetition is important. It's it's true. This is how we remember, you know, songs that come on the radio. It's because of that all that repetition, that's how you remember the song. So, let's move on to number 6. 6 is a cherry. You have to remember that 6 is the visual rep representation of a cherry. So here's the curvy part of the 6 and the bottom part. 6 should remind you of a cherry. 7 is going to be a lightning bolt. I need you to commit to memory that 7, you can think of a lightning bolt as just a bunch of sevens. Number eight is a racetrack. Again, just the general shape of an eight, although it'd be kind of weird if they made racetracks with actual intersections like this, although I guess there could be a bridge. Number eight is a racetrack. And number nine is a balloon. So picture a balloon just kind of blowing in the wind. You'll see where this is going in a moment. We need to memorize these visuals first. Number 10 is, you know, a plate and maybe some silverware, like a spoon or a fork. Or this could be a bowl and some silverware. I need you to remember that a 10 is the visual representation of like a place setting. Bowl or plate and silverware. So let's do a quick recap of 6 through 10. Do you remember what number 6 was? Hopefully you do. 6 is your cherry. Quick recap of number 7. Do you remember what the number 7 is? You should remember 7 is a lightning bolt. 8, you need to commit to memory right now. For this memory technique to work, you need to memorize all these numbers and their visual associations. 8 is a racetrack. Nine, do you remember what number nine was? It was a balloon. And 10 is a place setting. So I'm assuming you've got those covered. And for those of you in the future from when I'm talking that are watching this recording, if you don't have them all, you might want to pause and review them. But we're going to move on from here. So what do we do now that we have numbers one through 10 all visually associated? We go back to our list right here. And we have to basically create visual associations between these two things. Bread, you know what bread looks like. We have to associate bread to the number one, which is a pencil, swan, and milk, McDonald's, and tomatoes. This was a chair, four is a chair, and soda. So for example, let me give you, for number one, you remember, what is the visual for number one? One is a pencil, right? So you have to remember bread. How are you going to remember bread? Well, you need to come up with a visual that associates these two things, pencil and bread. And here's the other very, very important thing. That visual needs to be a little weird or out of the ordinary. It will help tremendously if you do that. So I'm gonna, for the sake of time here, I'm going to provide you with the visuals that I came up with and that will help you to remember this. But if you were doing this on your own, you would come up with your own visuals. So to start, let's start with a pencil. I want you to imagine that you're holding a pencil right now. Just imagine it in your mind. And on top of that pencil is a giant loaf of bread, okay? So, you know, you know, like cotton candy on a stick. Instead, I want you to imagine like a pencil with a giant loaf of bread on top, okay? So that's how we're going to remember number one. The way you'll remember it later on, by the way, is when I say what's number one, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, number one looks like a pencil. And then you'll ask yourself, what does that remind me of? Oh, yeah, I was holding a pencil with a large loaf of bread on top. And really exaggerate how big the loaf, don't make it a normal size loaf of bread, make it a giant loaf of bread. Next one is two. Now, number two, do you remember what the visual looks like? Hopefully you've remembered that it is a swan. Now the item we have to memorize is milk. So I want you to picture a swan swimming in a lake of milk. Why milk? Because that's what we have to memorize. Now notice this makes absolutely no sense. Uh, there's no such thing as you know, a lake of milk, except for in the land of milk and honey. Uh, I watched a lot of Winnie the Pooh as a kid. So this is uh, how we're going to remember number two. You'll picture a swan swimming gracefully through this lake of milk. 
And of course, it doesn't make sense, but that is actually useful that it doesn't make sense. The things that are weird will always be more memorable. Number three now. Do you remember three? The visual was McDonald's. Now, the item we have to get and memorize, the item we have to memorize is tomatoes. So what I want you to do is imagine you go to a McDonald's and you order a Big Mac. Even if you don't like Big Macs, just pretend that you ordered a Big Mac. And you might know how Big Macs look. And instead of beef patties, imagine there were thick slices, really, really thick slices of tomatoes in that Big Mac. So instead of the beef Big Mac, you've got like a veggie Mac. So picture that for a moment. You open up your Big Mac and there's this Big Mac with really thick slices of tomatoes in it. That's how we're going to remember number three. And the memory process is going to be simple. I'll ask you, what's number three? You'll be like, well, three looks like McDonald's. And that reminds me of this weird situation where I ordered a Big Mac and there were giant slices of tomatoes in my Big Mac. Notice how the easiest way to exaggerate something is just make it really big. Number four is a chair, you remember. And what is the item that we have to get? We have to get soda. Now, depending on where you're from, I grew up saying soda. You might say pop. You know what I mean. I'm thinking like, you know, Coca-Cola or Pepsi. Picture a chair that had legs made out of soda bottles. So, you know, those two liter bottles of soda. Imagine that those are the legs of your chair. So it's not a normal chair with like wooden legs or steel legs. Picture it as a leg, a chair with legs made out of soda bottles. How weird would that be? Imagine yourself even sitting on it. What would it feel like? If you can imagine these things, it'll make it very easy to remember the list. And again, in a little bit, once we memorize this list, we're going to go back and I'm going to teach you how you can apply this to to reading, remembering what you just read. But first, we're starting with a list. Five, you remember, was a hook, right? That's the visual association for five. Now, the thing we have to remember and memorize is turkey. So the best way to do this if you were doing it on your own is just think, what's the first thing I think of when I think of hooks? And for me, it's pirates. Hooks remind me of pirates. <laughs> and the first thing that I think of when I think of turkeys is you know, a turkey reminds me of Thanksgiving. So I try to combine this in a weird way Thanksgiving and turkey and hook and pirate. And the first thing that came to mind for me, and this is what I want you to imagine for this exercise, I want you to imagine that it's Thanksgiving Day, there's a knock on the door, and at the door is a pirate. Turns out it's some long-lost uncle you've never met, and he turns out to be a pirate. Well, this pirate shows up, you let him in because it's Thanksgiving and he's family, even though it's kind of weird that you're letting a pirate into your home. Uh, imagine this pirate uncle of yours is the one that gets to carve the turkey this year. And of course, because he's a pirate, he has a hook for a hand. And I want you to imagine this pirate carving the turkey with his hook of a hand. What would that look like if he was carving the turkey with his hook? Probably not the most efficient way to carve a turkey. Also, how disgusted would you be if you saw a pirate carving your turkey? You have no clue where that hook's been. So imagine this weird scenario for number five. And notice how, you know, the more elaborate and more detailed you can make these in your mind, the more memorable they'll be. So, Let's move on now to number six. Actually, quick recap of one through six. Do you remember what number one was? One was our pencil, and that reminded you of what? Remember the bread, right? So one was pencil with bread on top. Two reminds you of the swan, and the swan was swimming in a lake of milk. Three reminds you of McDonald's, and that should remind you of the Big Mac with really thick slices of tomatoes. Four should remind you of a chair, with legs made out of soda bottles. And five should remind you of a hook, that what we just said, the pirate carving the turkey on Thanksgiving. So now we move on to number six. And six is a cherry. I want you to imagine, that, first of all, six is, this is not what we have to get from the grocery store or on the grocery list. Six is just coordinated with the number. What we have to get from the store, or memor actually you don't have to get this from the store, obviously, but what we have to memorize from the list is chips. So what I want you to imagine is cherry-flavored chips. What would they What would they taste like? What would they What would they look like? You ever see like banana chips or apple chips? They're like thinly sliced pieces of dried fruit. Imagine cherry-flavored chips. Now, oh, by the way, you know what else we have going for us here? Cherry-flavored chips. What do they call that? Back in English class in high school, they would call that alliteration, right? When you had two letters at the beginning of two words that were the same, cherry chips. That will help you remember as well. Alliteration helps you remember things, rhyming, songs. Think about this. How do you remember your ABCs? You learned your ABCs through a song, right? A, B, C, D, F. <laughs> I'm not going to sing it here, but you get the idea. Same thing with alliteration. It helps you remember. And you could actually 
look at a lot of examples of alliteration when it comes to uh, companies. Companies will name themselves with alliteration because they feel their corporate name will be more memorable because of it. Think, think of companies like Coca-Cola. That's alliteration right there. Best Buy, Bed Bath & Beyond. Dunkin' Donuts, Krispy Kreme. We can we can go on here, but you get the idea. Alliteration helps you remember things as well. So cherry flavored chips, that should be an easy one. We remember the cherries, that will remind us of cherry flavored chips. Move on to number seven. What does seven look like? You should remember the lightning bolt, right? And the item we have to memorize is strawberries. So you can very easily memorize this image. Imagine a strawberry being struck by lightning. Now, I don't want you to think of a normal size strawberry. Let's blow it up, make it an exaggeratedly large strawberry near maybe an open window. It's raining outside, there's a thunderstorm, all of a sudden lightning strikes and it hits the strawberry. What would happen? I'm imagining it just blowing up. There's red strawberry goo all over the wall. Some of it hits you in the face. Imagine this weird scenario for number seven. So when I ask you what number seven is, it should remind you of that visual. And this will only work if you're actively trying to visualize this information as we're going over it, okay? So that could mean you're either closing your eyes to think about it, or you don't necessarily have to close your eyes. You could just kind of, a lot of people will just kind of like think and look up into the left, <laughs> you know, kind of like we're looking up to your our brain. That's how we're going to remember seven. And then we move on to eight. What does eight look like? Do you remember the visual for eight? It was a racetrack, right? There's the racetrack. Now what we have to get and remember is deodorant. So I want you to imagine, you know how race cars going around the racetrack? You know what a race car looks like. I want you to imagine instead of a regular race car, imagine they're like sticks of deodorant. So deodorant sticks, giant deodorant sticks that have wheels on them driving around this racetrack. That's what I want you to imagine for number eight. So you can almost think of them like a, like a speed stick, okay? So imagine, you know, those speed stick is a brand of deodorant going around and they're racing deodorant looking cars for number eight. Move on to number nine. Number nine is a balloon. Now you have to memorize cucumbers. So remember I said the easiest way to exaggerate something is to make it really, really big. So let's make our balloon very big. Imagine a blimp, okay? But it's not a Goodyear blimp. Um, it's going to be what kind of a blimp? A cucumber blimp, if you were thinking the same thing as me. Um, you'll have to excuse my horrible Photoshop skills there. But imagine a giant cucumber blimp in the sky, or an actual giant cucumber floating around in the sky. What what would it look like? What would it smell like outside? You know that smell of, you know, fresh cucumbers. And by the way, the reason why I'm asking you to, you know, what would it look like? What would it smell like? What would it feel like? That's because your five senses all help you remember things. You ever uh, hear a song and it reminds you of something? Or you ever have a scent, a certain, there's probably a certain scent associated with your school or a certain scent associated with your workplace or uh, your parents' home. Certain scents will help us remember things. So that's why I'm asking you to also incorporate your other five senses here. What would it smell like? What would it look like? That all will help you tremendously. So when I, when I tell you number nine later on, you need to remember a balloon. What kind of a balloon? A huge balloon, like a blimp. And that's going to remind you of the cucumber blimp. And then we move on to number 10. 10 is a plate and silverware or a bowl and silverware, and we have to memorize cereal. Now, I know what you're thinking here. Some people think, well, I'll just imagine myself pouring cereal inside of a bowl. But keep in mind, there's nothing strange about that. It's very normal. We want th these things to be exaggerated, to be memorable. Because keep in mind, if I ask you later, what's number 10? After a period of time, you might ask yourself, well, what was I pouring in the bowl? What could you pour in a bowl? You could pour a lot of things in a bowl. This could be oatmeal. It could be ramen noodles. It could be uh, pasta, SpaghettiOs, all sorts of things. And we need to exact. That's why we need to exaggerate these images so we don't confuse them with other normal things. So what I want you to imagine for this last image here, picture a giant bowl in the middle of an intersection. Huge bowl, middle of an intersection. And I want you to imagine that it's raining cereal from the sky. So... I want you to think right now, what's the first cereal that comes to mind? For me, it was Lucky Charms. Maybe it was something more healthy for you, <laughs> um, I hope. For, I don't know why I thought of Lucky Charms. But I, I would imagine Lucky Charms raining from the sky into this giant bowl of cereal that for some strange reason happens to be in the middle of an intersection. Do you have that image in your head? I hope you do, because at this point, we're going to do a quick recap. 
Do you remember number six? Six was our cherry, cherry flavored chips, right? Seven, what was seven? That was a lightning bolt. And that reminds you of the lightning bolt striking what? It was striking the strawberry and it blew up, remember? Number eight was our racetrack. And we imagined not regular race cars driving around the racetrack, but race cars that were shaped like deodorant sticks. Number nine, we remember the balloon. And that the only reason we remember the balloon is because nine has the similar shape to a balloon. That now reminds us of a huge balloon, like a blimp, specifically the cucumber blimp. And number 10 is our bowl. We remembered a huge bowl with cereal raining from the sky inside of it. Now, if we've gone through this, you know, visual learning exercise, you should be able to remember this list. If you made a quick little mental effort, you should be able to remember it. And actually, here's what we're going to do. For those of you that are here attending this live webinar, I'm going to go through numbers 1 through 10, and I want you to see if you could remember each item. So I've got them on the just blanks here. And just to show you how interesting this will be, I will, uh, I'm will. i going to go out of order. So I'm going to give you a number, and I want you to write down on a separate sheet of paper, or you can you know, type this out on your computer. Or for those of you in the webinar here live, you can type this into the chat box, see if you remember these things. I'm going to give you a number, and you have to tell me the item, the grocery item that you remember. So I don't want to go through an order, because that would be too easy. Let's start off with number four. So if you can remember number four, write it down. Or type it in the chat box if you're attending this live webinar. All right, next one. I want you to try to remember what was number eight. What was number eight? Type it in the chat box or write it down separately. Now watch this. I'm going to throw you a curveball and you'll be able to easily remember this. Instead of giving you a number, I'm going to give you the item and you have to know where to put it. So when I say cucumbers. Where should cucumbers go? What number is cucumbers associated with? So you could type that in or you could just write it down. All right, let's move on. I'll do this again. Where, where do chips go? Where should chips go on this list? What number is chips associated with? And what about number one? What's number one? Number two, write down number two. Number three, do you remember what number three was? And again, the process is very simple. We remember three. It reminded us of a certain image, and that reminds us of the item. Write down now number five. If you can remember what number five was, go ahead and write it down or type it into the chat box if you're attending live here. Number seven, write down number seven. What does seven remind you of? And then I think we're on our last one here, number ten. Write down what number 10 is or type it in. If you were able to get the whole list, awesome. And I'm going to give you the answers real quick here. For those of you, if you happen to miss any, most people actually, if they go through this process and they're thinking about the images, most people are able to get all 10, no problem. Why? Because they were visually remembering these things. So number one, that reminds you of the pencil with the loaf of bread. So bread was number one. Two was the swan. That reminded you of the swan swimming in the lake of milk. I don't even have to show you the answers here. You you know if you got them right or not. By the way, if you wrote down pineapples at any point here, uh, we've got serious memory issues, right? <laughs> so you know if you got these right or not. And if you missed one, that's why we're going over the answers. Three, was McDonald's. Reminds you of what? You go to McDonald's, you get a Big Mac. Tomatoes is number three. Four is the chair. That reminds you of soda. The legs made out of soda bottles. Five was the hook. That reminds you of the pirate, right? Showing up for Thanksgiving, carving the turkey. Five is turkey. Six was cherry. That reminds you of cherry flavored chips. Chips is six. Seven is lightning. And that reminds you of what? The lightning striking the strawberry. That's seven. Eight is a racetrack, and you remember the de deodorant sticks going around the racetrack. Nine was our balloon, the cucumber blimp. Cucumbers. Obviously, we're not going to the store to get blimps. Ten is a bowl and silverware. That reminds you of the cereal. If you're able to get it, very good. I want to go over, though, how do you apply this to reading? Because I know some people are like, okay, I memorized the list. What use is that? Um, and by the way, it's a little easier to just write a list down <laughs> rather than, you know, going through this process. The only reason I wanted to go through this on a list is to show you, one, that this works. And now we can apply it to something a little more complex, which is reading. Remember, this technique, this 
memory technique is called the numeric peg system because each number is getting pegged to a visual. One was pegged to a pencil, two was a swan, and so on. Let's apply it to how do you remember what you read? Well, this is very simple. You just list out the things that you need to memorize. Now, this is especially helpful if you need to memorize things in order. That isn't always the case. Sometimes you just need to memorize a list of things in not any particular order, but if you do need to remember an order, this will help. And don't worry, a little later on, we're going to talk about how do you go beyond 10. But right now, if you had to memorize, let's say you went through a chapter and you had to just generally remember, you know, all the topics that were covered in the chapter. You would just put a topic next to each one of these numbers, and then you would have to create those visual associations. So whatever topic number one is, you have to associate visually in your head to a pencil. Whatever topic number two is, is going to be visually associated to a swan. Three is going to be associated to McDonald's and so on and so forth. These topics, at first you might want to write them down, or you might, if you were reading a textbook, you would put a number next to each heading, possibly. Now, there's a variety of, you know, ways you might need to memorize something. What if you don't have to memorize the, you know, topics in a chapter? What if you have to memorize a very specific nine-step, let's say, a nine-step process in a very specific order? Well, then you would apply this system to that nine-step process. And you could apply this to various things, and you'll remember them usually in context. But here's an example. Number one, you see right here, Constitution. There was a student in one of our classes not too long ago, and she was preparing for law school. And she was reading a textbook on the topic of constitutional law. She had a chapter, it was about 30 pages or so. Section number one of that chapter, they were talking about the writing of the U.S. Constitution and the founding fathers and so forth. So the way she was able to remember that, well, first of all, we have pencil here. So that's kind of a nice coincidence that we have pencil and writing of constitution. And initially she was thinking, well, I'll imagine Thomas Jefferson writing the constitution with a pencil. But I remember telling her, well, there's no exaggeration there. Well, how can we exaggerate this image? And she had a really great idea. She said, you know what? I'm going to picture him writing the constitution, Thomas Jefferson writing the constitution with one of those giant novelty pencils. You ever see them in like gift shops? They're like just ridiculously large. She was imagining Thomas Jefferson writing Constitution with that. And section number two of her chapter was about the court system in the U.S., how you have, you know, the three levels of courts. You have the, the federal courts, Supreme Court, right? You have federal, you have state courts, and you also have local courts. So federal, state, and local, three different courts. Now, so that was section number two. The way She had a really good way of remembering this, and it was very simple. She's like, I'm just going to picture three swans. Why are we using swans? Because section two is about court system and two is associated with swan. So she pictured three swans, a big one, a medium one, and a small one. So three different sizes of swans. And she just pictured them swimming around to remember. That would trigger her to remember, oh yeah, number two in the chapter, second part of the chapter was about the court system in the U.S. and how you have these three levels. And then you just continue on from there whatever section number three or whatever thing number three you need to remember is going to be associated with McDonald's. And there are a variety of ways you can associate with McDonald's. You could, th we were earlier talking about Big Macs. You could think about, you know, Ronald McDonald. You could think about French fries. There's all sorts of like visual references for number three and four would be chair, whatever topic four is. So notice how we're always, we always want to use exaggeration because that will help us remember things very easily. But what if you have to remember more than 10 things? Because sometimes you got to remember maybe 18 things or 20 some things. There's a very simple way to expand this system. So I want to go over that really quickly. Here's how it works. Let's say this was your new list. We've got all the same items here, the 1 through 10. But we've got now an 11 and a 12. 11 is cookies, 12 is coffee. How would you remember 11 and 12? Or if your list was even longer than 12 items? What you have to do is create a visual rule for 11 through 20. So for 11 through 20, your visual rule can be anything that's easy to visualize. I'll give you an example. Let's say our rule was snow. Let's say 11 through 20, you have to associate with something something to do with snow. And snow, we could have a lot of references. Snowmen, just a bunch of snow like this image, or a snowball. Here's what I mean by snow. Here's how it would work. Let's say number 11. Remember we said 11. Notice how it has a one in the two digits here, number one. That means we have to use a pencil in our image. 
But we also have to include these two other items. First of all, we have to memorize cookies. But why are we using snow? Why? Because this is number 11, and we decided that our rule for 11 through 20 would be snow. Everything 11 through 20. And again, I said, there's no particular reason why this is snow. I just made that up right now. <laughs> you can choose this to be cars. It could be rain. <laughs> it could be any kind of a visual uh, reference that you want. So here's how it would work. We have to include in our image something exaggerated, something weird that includes pencil, something snow related, and something cookies related. So you might imagine a snowman holding a pencil with a bunch of large cookies, like balancing. Imagine a snowman balancing with a pencil large cookies. Okay? Now I know this doesn't make any sense, but you know what? It'll help you remember it. Normal things are easily forgotten. So let's say we moved on to number 12. Now, number 12, notice how it has a 2 in it. So we have to use a swan, but we also have to use snow again. Now, if you're wondering why we're using snow again, it's simply because we decided we would create a visual rule for 11 through 20, and that rule would be snow. Again, this could be whatever you want. So if we had 12 now, we have to combine a swan, we have to include snow, and we have to also include number 12, which on our list is coffee. So how are we going to include Swan, snow, and coffee. You come up with your own visual image, but here's an example. Um, you can imagine, uh, picture a giant coffee cup, and inside of that giant coffee cup is a giant swan swimming around through the coffee, and it's snowing on top of this. So you imagine this weird scenario, and if you had to remember what number 12 was, the first thing you would obviously remember is the swan, because there's a two there. The next thing you'd remember is, well, I got to use snow, something going on with snow. And then you'd remember, oh, yeah, it was snowing, and there was this swan swimming in this giant coffee cup outside. So, again, you create these exaggerated images, and you could build this system as high as you need to make it. You create another rule for 21 through 30. That rule might be, let's say it was cars. You create another rule for 31 through 40. That could be whatever you want, so long as you can visualize it. And this is how you can easily build up the system. And I'm, I'm not going to, you know, some people say, well, it, you know, it takes a little bit of mental effort to do that. Yes, but it's still a lot better than just staring at a page and hoping that you'll somehow memorize the information. That's what a lot of people resort to. A lot of people, you know, they might do flashcards or they just might stare at something. This is an actual strategy for memorizing a list of information. Whether it's, you could apply this, if you had to memorize a presentation, you could use this. If you had to remember, you know, all the topics that were covered in a chapter, you can use this as well. Now, what about moving beyond this? Let's talk about a very specific thing like memorizing equations. If you had to remember an equation, let's think about the different components of an equation. And obviously, this is a very simplistic one, um, and probably one of the most popular equations out there, E equals MC squared. Well, think about what equations have. Equations have, I would say, three components. Component number one would be, a lot of times equations will have numbers in them, right? They will also have variables like X, Y, Z, you know, other variables like pi, they also have operators, right? A plus sign, a minus sign, maybe a division or a multiplication operator. So what you need to do is we need to create visuals for all of these things, for numbers, for variables, and for operators. How do we do that? Well, how are we going to do the numbers? Well, guess what? We already have the numbers. Our numeric peg system, we got these numbers down already. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. We know those are all associated to 1 is a pencil, 2 is a swan, McDonald's, chair, We've already visually memorized that, so that's good. Now we got variables. How are we going to remember variables like X, Y, Z, or whatever they are? Variables, you just have to create an image that will remind you of that particular variable. So pi, probably the simplest one, <laughs> is very easy to associate to a pi. But what about X? Well, X, that kind of looks like a runway, like, you know, for planes taking off and landing. So I, X's would remind me of runways. So I'd ha if I had an X in the equation, part of the visual that I'd come up with in my mind would have to include a runway. The Let's say the variable you had was C. Okay, well, C is going to represent Pac-Man, let's say, because it has a similar shape. Now, by the way, you don't have to do all these variables based on shape. The letter Z, let's say you had Z in your equation, that could represent a zebra. Why? Because Z is for zebra. 
the whole key here is that you're trying to memorize things visually. The human mind does not like to remember abstract information. Abstract information by its very nature is very hard to remember, like numbers or equations or what you just read, words and paragraphs and ideas. Um, it's easier if you remember things visually. That's why we're assigning visuals to all these operators. Well, I'm sorry, operators, variables. But what about the operators? Operators are things like, you know, plus signs, division, you know, you might have exponents in your equation. How do we how do we deal with those? Well, the plus sign, we could just think of it as an action. O operators are going to include actions in our visuals. So plus sign, I'm thinking things being stacked on top of one another. So something is being stacked on top of something else in the image. The minus sign is going to represent, you know, something being taken away, maybe something being stolen. The, the multiplication sign, now by the way, when I show you an X here, I don't mean the variable now. I'm talking about the operator. A multiplication sign would represent things being multiplied, like all these kittens over here. So things being multiplied, and you have other types of operators too. You might have a, a division sign in there. Well, division could just make you think of things getting sliced, because that's what division is, right? You might slice something in half. You might slice it in thirds. You might slice it in fourths. And what about when you have... Uh, parentheses. Ah, how do we deal with parentheses? I would come up with an image and imagine, you know, like something being hugged or pulled together or maybe, you know, something being tied together because that's what parentheses do. What if you had exponents? Exponents could, in, it could visually represent something floating, okay? Something floating or flying. Now, for example, let's say you had five square. You see five square? What does the five remind you of? Remember in the numeric peg system, five was a hook? So I would picture like a pirate, as you see right here. And the two, it's an exponent here. So like five square, two is a swan, right? So you might imagine a pirate and a swan flying above the pirate, and maybe the swan is attacking the pirate, or the pirate is trying to hit away the swan that's you know trying to attack it. So you might imagine this weird, exaggerated visual. The idea here is if you had a long equation... Here's a simple example, but if you had some sort of an equation, each one of these things has to come be become a visual representation that you could remember. So in this instance, where we have y equals mx plus b, y, my visual for that might be like a wishbone, because it has a similar shape. Notice there, it looks like a y. M, all right, well, that looks like mountains, and also m is the first letter of mountains. So mountains are going to be involved in my image. X is going to be, there's going to be some sort of a runway in the image. The plus sign is just, just means that something's going to be stacked on top of something else. And the B, this has a similar shape to maybe like a golf club or a putter, like you see right here. Now, the idea is that you take all of these elements in a in this particular order, and you come up with a visual story. Now, you're probably wondering, well, how am I going to make a story out of all these elements? Well, you're try if you're having trouble, it's because you're trying to think of something that would make sense. It's best to come up with an image that doesn't make any sense at all. And if you include these different visual elements, a wishbone, mountains, a, land, you know, a runway, something being stacked on top, and then a putter or a golf club, there's no way you could come up with something that makes total sense. And that's actually the beauty of this kind of a, kind of a technique. You're trying to remember things in a very weird, exaggerated way. So... Let me give you another example here, uh, because we're talking about how to memorize things visually. Every so often you have vocabulary that you have to memorize. You get a new word or equation you've never, not equation, but a word that you've never seen before. How do you memorize the meaning of that word? And it might be a foreign language or it might be in English, but it's in a very technical topic. It's new vocabulary you have to memorize. There's a technique called the similar sound technique. That's what we're going to talk about right now. The similar sound technique is very simple. Let me give you an example. Here's a word you're probably familiar with, claustrophobia. I'm guessing you probably already know what this means. Claustrophobia is the fear of closed spaces. Now, if you were trying to teach this to a little kid, you, ha you have to find a similar sound that they could associate to. And in this case, similar sound, I would say claws in here, would remind them of maybe Santa Claus. Claustrophobia. Now, claustrophobia has nothing to do with Santa Claus. But that's okay. We're just going to use Santa Claus to help us remember the definition. So you would tell this little kid, imagine Santa Claus. We have to include the, the meaning of the word, which is a fear of closed spaces, plus, you know, something to do with Santa Claus. So I would imagine Santa Claus being stuck in a chimney and him being afraid of, like, tight chimney spaces 
getting stuck inside of those chimney spaces. And of course, you if you were teaching this to a little kid who didn't know the meaning to, of this, we would teach them and tell them, you're going to remember claustrophobia is the fear of closed spaces. So imagine Santa Claus being afraid of closed, tight chimney spaces, getting stuck in those chimney spaces. And that's how they would remember this particular word. Or if they had another word, like, here, here's a good example. You probably don't know the meaning of this, unless you take a moment to Google it right now. I'll tell you what the meaning is. <laughs> the meaning, this is blown phobia. This is the fear of needles, believe it or not. The extreme fear of needles. How are we going to remember this? Well, we again, look for a similar sound in this word. What kind of similar sounds do you see? Now, you might see phobia, and you probably already know phobia is the fear of. So I would actually ignore phobia for now. What similar sounds do you see here? Balloon, like be alone, maybe? Or baloney, baloney, like the deli meat? <laughs> or you might even uh, see this kind of sounds like balloon. Bal now, it doesn't sound exactly the same. But remember, this is the similar sound technique, not the exact sound technique. So I would imagine if I had to choose between be alone, that image, or baloney, that image, or balloon, and I got a link back to Fear of Needles. I don't know about you, but I think I'm going to go the balloon route. I'm going to focus on a big blue balloon. It could be whatever color you want. And I got to combine that with Fear of Needles. So this is pretty simple, right? You would imagine a giant balloon being afraid of needles. You could imagine multiple needles coming towards it. You could imagine it sweating, you know, yelling for help. And obviously we're totally aware that balloons have no capabilities of emotion, but Utilizing this kind of a weird image will help us remember. That's the same thing we would apply if we had another word like anthrophobia. What similar sounds do you see in anthrophobia? This is, by the way, the fear of people. We have to remember fear of people. Uh, now, you could have gotten that from anthro, the prefix here, like if you link that to anthropology. But what if you didn't make that association? You could also use another similar sound like ant. Well, anthro is one of them, but ant is another. Ant reminds me of like the insects, ants, or it could could also remind you, by the way, of like an ant in your family. But we have to combine ant and fear of people. How are we going to do that? Well, I would just imagine, you know, an ant being afraid of people stepping on it. So you might imagine a whole bunch of ants running for help and footsteps are crashing down upon them and they're afraid of people stepping on them. So all we're doing is combining the meaning with an image that we come up. How are we getting that image? It's from a similar sound. Again, because we remember things visually. Now, this is a very common Spanish word. It means chicken, pollo. If you had to memorize this, what similar sounds do you see in this word? Well, you might see poll, P-O-L-L, -L, right? Like going to a poll. You might imagine a bunch of people go to the voting polls and they end up voting for a chicken for president, let's say, or or maybe there you go to the voting poll and there's a bunch of chickens there that are actually voting. Or you... You could also take this similar sound, P-O, that reminds me of Poe, like Edgar Allan Poe. And I might imagine instead of a raven on his head, I would imagine like a chicken on his head. And maybe it's pecking at the top of his head. So you see how this works. Same thing with like, a, this is the Spanish word for floor, piso. Well, you could imagine like peas, that peas. You could imagine a bunch of peas on the floor and you're slipping on them, or you might imagine some giant peas all over the floor. Either way, I think you get the idea here that you're just taking a similar sound and you're trying to link it to an image. Why an image? Because we remember visual information very easily. And you want to exaggerate it, of course. And that's how you remember things very, very easily. Now, I want you to think back. Can you still remember the 10 item list from earlier? Think about it for a moment. If you're watching the recording, you can pause it right now and try to write it down. See if you can still remember that list. If you're able to remember all 10 items, I'll show you them right now. If you can remember all these, very good. You've been successful in this webinar. You get the success baby here. So what we've covered today is you know, visual memory techniques. We talked about how to remember what you read with the numeric peg system, how to remember equations. That included numeric peg system and coming up with visuals for the operators and the variables. And we talked about how to remember vocabulary. Very important things. Now, where do we go from here? This is very important. First of all, application. Try applying this. But also, if you're trying to go beyond this webinar, I told you earlier that this webinar is actually part of a series we've, we did on uh, in our Speed Reading Mastery course. It's a series of 10 webinars. Each webinar 
is anywhere from 30 minutes to 60 minutes in length. Most of them are around like 45 minutes to an hour. And number in number one, this is to help you read faster. Webinar number one was how to read groups of words. That helps you speed up your reading speed. Webinar number two in the series is how to reduce subvocalization. If you've noticed, when you read, a lot of times you say the words in your head. Most people do. And this actually slows you down because if you're saying all the words in your head, they call that subvocalization. If you're saying all the words in your head, that means you're only going to read as fast as you talk. Remembering more through spaced learning, that was webinar number three. This is a very interesting concept on how you can remember things more efficiently through spaced learning. Essential eye training, this is to get your eyes used to seeing words at a rapid pace so you can read faster. Learning to read and remember visually, that was actually, there's some overlap here. The webinar we did today is covered in webinar five in this series. How to sharpen your focus to improve your speed. If you feel like your mind wanders off when you're reading, then uh, this webinar is definitely for you. Um, this will help you increase your ability to concentrate. Webinar number seven in the series is high-speed comprehension strategies. How do you get comprehension when you're going at an above-average reading speed? Number eight is the most efficient way to speed read the news. So all of us kind of want to stay on top of what's going on in the world. This is a great webinar that covers efficient ways for speed reading the news. Webinar nine in the series was advanced speed reading exercises. This is if you're really trying to go a lot faster, like tripling your reading speed. And webinar 10 was how to read a book in one day. All of these webinars are part of the Speed Reading Mastery course. Again, they're 30 to 60 minutes in length. Um, and this webinar series also includes a bonus of how to remember names, because a lot of people that are interested in memory topics also want to learn how to remember names efficiently. If you're interested in this package of webinars, go to irisreading.com mastery. We have a special offer for people that have uh, enrolled in this webinar. And each webinar, when we did this, was recorded. Each webinar was $25. There's 10 webinars total, so that's a $250 package. If you go to this link right here, you can get it at a discounted rate for a limited time of just 50 bucks. So again, we wanted to do this as a service to people that have joined us in the webinar. If you've stayed all the way to the end of the session and you've memorized the list, you've memorized what balloon phobia means, do you still remember that? Do you still remember what anthrophobia means? If you've gone all the way up to here, um, we're happy to give you a discount. Again, go to this link right here. This is going to be available for a limited time, irisreading.com slash mastery. And if you have any questions, I've got my contact information on the screen right here. Um, also, if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, I've got my contact info there as well, or on Twitter. Uh, again, you can get that special offer at irisreading.com slash mastery. Um, I've got my contact information here because every so often we have people that have additional questions. If you have those additional questions, you can reach out to me directly. I will. I get a lot of emails every day. I will try to get back to you as soon as I can. Also, if you're interested in holding one of these workshops, whether it's memory or speed reading on your campus, we, we've done them in a variety of formats from 60 minutes to 90 minutes to three-hour sessions to longer, more comprehensive six-hour intensive sessions, um, feel free to contact me. We'd be happy to organize a session on your campus, whether it's, you know, during this term or the following term. But I want to thank you so much for attending the webinar. I know a number of questions came in uh, during the during the uh, session. I'll answer those at the end of this session. And if I don't get to all of them, you can email me your question and I'll try to get back to you by email. So again, thank you guys so much for attending the webinar and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.